published in 1978, founded by Martha Longenecker, and you started working there in April 2021. It is hard. It's really hard to get a position in cultural heritage in general, but in museums, it is so hard to get your foot in the door. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Weekend Talk, a show that brings professionals in cultural heritage directly to you. As always, this episode is brought to you by Save Cultural Heritage Group. I'm your host, Megan Kamoyak, and I am an archaeologist and Egyptologist currently based in London. Super exciting, I know, nothing has changed. <laughs> Today, I am joined by an anthropologist and freelance conservator, just to name a few, who has extensive experience in things like museums, historical research, production assisting, uh, everything under the sun. So here to tell us more about that and then some. Hello, Nicole, welcome to Weekend Talk. Hi, thanks for having me. It's great to have you. It's always nice to meet new people on here. And I think the audience is quickly realizing there's a lot of people in cultural heritage from all backgrounds from all around the world. So I'm going to let you just introduce yourself since I think everyone knows the, the format of these episodes already. So we can skip that bit. We'll just go right into tell us more about you. Hey, yeah. So I currently work at a museum. I'm an assistant registrar, um, which basically means that I work with the collection, um, as well as kind of handling paperwork. That's the that's the fun part I think about, or the not so fun part about collections or um, cultural heritage work, archaeology, anthropology, museums. You have the fun and hands-on field work, but there's always paperwork behind it. So that's just something so I think much. that everybody should know. There's always paperwork, um, but that's what gets you to be able to do the fun hands-on stuff. Um, so yes, I currently work in a museum, but it has been quite a journey to get here. I you know, have done archeology, span I've worked in the field, loved it. Um, I've also worked on historical projects, film projects for national parks, um, book and paper restoration. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of different things that you can do in cultural heritage, but I think the thread that runs through all of that is preservation and education um, and kind of engaging with history and the public as well. Um, so even though I myself don't feel like I'm someone who often, I'm not so much as like, of a communicator. I'm not any sort of you know, historical communicator or science communicator. Um, it is important for us, for the people that work in cultural heritage to share that information with the public because that's how we continue to protect it. That's how we continue um, on saving these pieces and objects and artifacts, especially in contested, you know, times of like now. So yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> Love it. I mean, there's so many things we can talk about with that. You've had such a great career. I want to say a lot of people don't get to delve into so much like you have. So I guess the first question that everyone always asks is like, how did you find yourself in the role that you're in now? What got you passionate about everything? Yeah, I think, I mean, it goes back to childhood, right? Like we all, I can vividly remember third grade browsing, you know, the section and pulling books on Egypt. I thought I was going to be an Egyptologist. I thought I was going to be you. <laughs> and then <laughs> um, just so much changes. Um, I went to school. I got a bachelor's degree from the University of Texas in Austin and um, in anthropology. And I did my first field school there as well. Um, and I still wasn't sure. I had no idea what I was going to do. I was lost for sure. And I just kind of randomly stumbled into, I moved back home to San Antonio, Texas, and stumbled into this store that sold rare books. And um, the owner was just like, oh, you know, what are you interested in? And I, we got to talking and he was like, oh, do you want to start tomorrow? We do restorations here. I'll teach you. And I was like, Sure, <laughs> that sounds great. I had also lined up a field tech position in Austin for archaeology, and I was looking forward to moving back. But it was one of those experiences where you're like, it's fork in the road. So I just chose one, and I think it was a good choice. Um, book restoration is a lot of fun, and even though it's very restoration is very different from conservation. Um, conservators go to school for quite a long time. There's so much science involved. There's so much chemistry involved. Whereas restoration, 
there, we kind of had a joke where we were like, you know, your everyday kind of like your poor man's conservator, right? Like you just had families of people with Bibles, books that were being passed down through generations and they couldn't necessarily or want to necessarily consult with a conservator that worked through a university or a museum. They just kind of needed someone to tell them how you can fix this, how you can preserve it so that they can keep passing it down. Um, and I think through that position, I learned a lot about individuals and families wanting to preserve their own traditions, their own legacies. It's a lot bigger, you know, when you're working in a museum, you're, you're seeing artifacts and objects that people across the world love. And you kind of forget that it can be very macro and micro as well. Like it can be very familial. Um, history starts with a family and and tradition being passed down. So I really appreciated that position to help me kind of learn that. Um, and then I moved out to California and wanted to work in a museum. It is hard, it's really hard to get a position in cultural heritage in general, but in museums, it is so hard to get your foot in the door. So I was doing everything that I could to kind of balance finding my way in and then staying there. So I met with the exhibition designer for our museum. I just sent an email kind of like, hey, can you show me? Can you give me a tour? And then I remained a thorn on his side until he remembered that I had done um, work with books and that museum was installing a rare book show. And he was like, oh, I remember that I had given a tour to this girl who won't leave me alone and she worked with books. Maybe she would be great. Um, and helping us install this exhibition. So that's how I got my foot in the door. I had to work multiple jobs to kind of maintain that position, which is an, un, you know, it's the truth of this kind of work. Um, so I worked in coffee shops and I was a coach at a gym for a while. Um, also that I could just keep that position. And now I work full time there. So it's a, it's a journey and, um, yeah. Yeah, it is a process. I think everyone just expects that, okay, you have that degree or you have all those degrees. Um, now you can just jump right in, you can get a job. And that's not the case. Like I do all this on the side. I think one of the things that pays my bills the most is something even outside of cultural heritage. Like I work with puppies for my actual living. Um, and it's also like really hard with the pandemic is just jobs, especially now in cultural heritage are so far a few between and now they're precarious because not everyone can go to a museum or you can't get clearance to go excavate somewhere and it's all because right. of like yeah travel bans or just limitations and yeah it's interesting to see how you definitely just took what was given to you and made it work and you did find your way to something that you enjoy and I think a lot of people can relate to that even if they're not in cultural heritage. Yeah I think too you know there's a trend um, especially where you know, it is unfortunate in terms of like accessibility and equity that you have to do so much unpaid work and cultural heritage to get the experience that's necessary to kind of get your foot in the door to begin with. I did do a lot of volunteer work um, and working in, you know, like an archeological collection, um, field work just on a volunteer basis because I love it. And it's just a way to keep, you know, keep you working. Um, but all of that looks really good. And I don't have a master's degree. I, you know, I just have a bachelor's degree. And so it's like, how can I make myself look good for on my resume, right? Like, how do I show that this is something that I'm interested in? Um, and it's constantly figuring out like, okay, I have a weekend. What can I do right now? Can I take an online class that's free that kind of gives me a leg up or gives me a little bit more information? or even just teaches me something that I'm interested in, all of that really builds upon, you know, your skill set. Um, and in this field, we all know, I mean, these fields don't have a lot of money to them. So it is just kind of part of the part of the process is volunteering and really kind of, it's just a passion project. It's unfortunate, but it is, it's definitely passion that gets you through it. 
Yeah, you can't enter into this field thinking you're going to be super rich or that it's just going to be really like a quick success story. I think right. a lot of people will see movies like Indiana Jones or like Tomb Raider or obviously The Mummy. And they're like, yes, that, I can easily be successful so quickly. I just need to find one object. I'll get tenure. It'll be great. And I'm like, nope that's just it's not, <laughs> not it quite. at all yeah and not it quite. is really unfortunate that we are in a position where a lot of things have to be volunteer experiences first I know so many excavations you pay to go excavate just so that you can maybe write something about it and you're not going to get paid to write about it unless right. you work for a university so it can be kind of difficult but it's nice that you found yourself in a museum now and you can work with those types of materials that actually bring you joy and it can also bring you a living, which is fantastic success story, especially with just a bachelor's degree. I think all of us can bow down to that <laughs> because people freak out when they hear, oh my gosh, I need to get all these degrees. I'm like, not necessarily. You can, you can do it. And yep, mm -hmm. success. Round of applause to you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, with all of your work with museums now that you do, and uh, your past experience with restoring objects, what has been like your favorite thing to work with or what was something unexpected that you've actually enjoyed? Ooh. Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think anybody that knows me knows that I love the Alamo. <laughs> I love Alamo history. So Texas history. Um, the place where I did restorations was right across the street from the Alamo. Um, and getting to work on, you know, Republic of Texas, Republic of Mexico era objects um, was really special for me. And then in my current museum, we have such a large variety of objects in our collection. So things that range from um, textiles to 2D paintings to ceramics, we have it all. Um, and I think with having like an anthropological and an archeological background, I was more interested in just, you know, 3D objects, kind of representations of cultural material in that way. And not so much having an art background, but learning the importance of textiles and um, objects of kind of adornment has been really fascinating recently. So, and also, I just want to say, I keep saying the term object, and what I mean by that is, I think different museums use different verbiage. So like an archaeological museum would obviously say artifacts because that's what their collection is made up of. Whereas a fine art museum could say, like, we have a collection of paintings because that's what we have. Whereas my museum, like I said, the collection is so broad that object is kind of just more of an inclusive term. So if you hear me saying that, you're like, why that term? Why not artifact? That's why because not all of them are artifacts and I like yeah. that <laughs> that's great kind of museum to have where you can see living history I think that's really important for people to realize is we tend to go to museums and separate ourselves from what we're seeing even if it is from the area that we're born and raised in we'd be like oh that's just in the past it has nothing to do with me it's just history and then you go to a museum like yours and it's it's still living it's still existing it's still engaging with its community and I think it's a great way to ask then um, obviously, like Indiana Jones always says, it belongs in a museum. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Like, what should we place in museums? What maybe should we leave to not a museum, leave outside <laughs> of it? Like, delve deep into that kind of very controversial thing of it belongs in a museum. I know. I think that one line really informed generations of people on what they think a museum is um, and what it should be or what it should have. There are definitions of a museum, but in general, I think it's just a place where objects go to be preserved. And then there's also this educational component, right? Like they, especially if it's a public museum, like these pieces belong to the public and it's the job of the people that work there to use their collection, to have exhibitions, to engage the public, to teach them something about, about these pieces. So like what belongs in a museum can really range. I think a lot of it depends on the mission of a specific museum. Um, whereas, so let me try and gather my thoughts here. Um, what belongs in a museum is anything that is deemed kind of 
worthy of preservation. And that can vary so much. And that really comes down to a museum's mission on whether they would take it into their collection or whether it should go to a, a different museum um, or a different cultural heritage institution or a private collection as well. Um, but oh, that's so tricky. <laughs> yeah, there's like no right answer, is there? There's, there's no right answer. There's no right yeah. answer, but it's, when you're talking about a collection and people like in my position that work with the collection, registrars, um, collections managers, curators, like we all consider ourselves stewards of a museum. Um, and what that means is that technically a museum can own a piece, but we're not the owners of this, right? These are not our objects. So we steward them. We kind of manage the care. We manage the preservation of them. We, we do our best to make sure that they continue on in their current state of stability and the ability to be shared with the public. Um, so what belongs in a museum is just anything that has that component of how do we, how does this teach the public something about this culture or something about a specific artist or a maker or, um, you know, a, a ceremony or anything that they may not know anything about that was that was very well said honestly okay. there, like you said there's like there's no there's no right answer to any of it and when you're dealing with any type of object whether a living history or a history maybe long forgotten um mm -hmm. you kind of just have to approach it like you said with that educational aspect of it it's like what can this teach someone who's going to see this object what does someone take away from that object or that art or that artifact and I, I would like to ask since like you do now work in a museum you've worked in various other areas how do you think like technology can help with engaging with that educational side or bringing access to uh, museums or objects to people that like don't necessarily have the ability to like get up and go see your work or sure. get up and go see a place what, what is how does technology play that role yeah, so a lot of places have been digitizing their collections and putting them onto their websites. So I also think the pandemic had a huge effect on this, right? Where we're seeing um, online exhibitions where you could do 3D virtual tours and it got, I mean, I was able to see exhibitions in Italy and Spain where, I mean, I'm not going there anytime soon, especially during a pandemic. Um, but yeah, so a big project is kind of moving away from from just paper and putting things into into the onto the web. So museums have like online collections databases, and this is where all of the information is stored. And this is part of my job as a, as a registrar is keeping track of that information and constantly updating our database to reflect the new things that we have learned about a piece or about an artifact. Um, and then that is being shared through our website. So when people are unable to visit our museum, they can always go and look online and kind of explore our collections. And I mean, there are so many fascinating things. Like if I'm looking or researching an object that we have, that we have no information on, I use other museum online collections to research, to see if they have you know comparable objects and learn that way. So it's incredibly helpful. And I would encourage anybody that's kind of interested in you know, museums in general to just kind of peek around and see what kind of objects they collect, kind of compare that to their mission statement. So you can have an idea of like what they are searching for, what kind of objects does this museum look for in terms of obtaining them for their collection, either by donation or purchasing. Yeah, love it. Cause I, I don't think people realize that's a thing anymore. They're like, oh yeah, I need to go to a museum or I need special access to get digitized information. And a lot of museums now are making it more accessible. You don't actually need to be a part of an institution to access their digital records, which is great. Absolutely. I mean, too, you know, public museums belong to the public. Um, if you're going to a museum, you're seeing what's on exhibition. You're not seeing what's in the collection. Um, and so you, you actually get, you're kind of, at an advantage being able to look at their online collection because you're seeing things that even if you were to visit, you may not be able to see because there's a variety of reasons why something may not be on exhibition. Maybe it will in the future based on an exhibition schedule, or maybe it's too vulnerable, too fragile 
um, and unstable to be put on view at any point in time unless it's conserved. So yeah, I, I would definitely think that you're not at any sort of disadvantage if you're only visiting a museum in person. Being able to look at their online collection is really important. Has there been anything while digitizing something or go like archiving something? Has there ever been something that you found that was unexpected or that you learned something new unexpectedly about something that you were working on? Oh yeah, all the time, <laughs> all <laughs> the time. I think working in a, you know, in my the, the museum I work at has been around for a few decades. So it's not something like the Pitt Rivers Museum or the British Museum that have collections you know, going back to the 1800s. So um, th there are a ton of things. We were currently working on an exhibition where was researching an object that said it was pig's teeth, a necklace, a pig's tooth necklace. Um, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. And a co colleague of mine was looking more into it and realized it was dog's teeth. Like there are always things that you're looking into that you either had bad information on based on how it got to the museum. So like the collector may not have known fully or the information they were given wasn't accurate or they thought it was accurate and there's just more information coming out now. Um, so we have objects all of the time when we're working with um, you know, particular consultants or experts in these fields with pieces, even Japanese textiles recently, we had one that we thought was made out of hemp and um, an expert came and he looked at it and he was like, nope, this is cotton. Just something simple like that, but can really change the way that that object, the context of that piece, like if it were to be put on view or even just on the online collection, having that information be accurate is super important. So that's a really big part of our work as well. Yeah, and it's great yeah, to, to talk about that just because people think, oh, it's in a museum, everything that's on that plaque is accurate and it will always be that way. And what I know about it now is not going to change. And it's like, no, museums are still learning institutions as well. They are learning every day about that object that they've put on display somewhere or the object that's in an archive. And it's cool to know that you can go to a museum, you can go to the online resources and then check back tomorrow and something might have updated because they, you know, you guys learned something new. Yes. And also, I mean, I would encourage you if you know something about it, if you know something about a piece on the online collection or even that you're viewing in person, share that. I, if we've had that happen a couple of times more recently where someone is like, oh, the, the way that these letters are written, the piece actually needs to be turned this way. And you're just like, wow, I had no idea. Thank you so much for sharing that with me. And you can update everything accordingly. So yeah, if you know something, don't think that as museum staff, we know more than anyone. We don't. <laughs> we just um, have the ability to make those changes. Um, so yeah, we're definitely not yeah. experts in everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, experts are just like, yeah, we, we know as much as we know right now, but that doesn't exactly. mean you're not going to learn something tomorrow. And I like that. It's, yeah. And you have to engage the public. Like you said, it's a public institution. So the public shouldn't feel like they can't engage and they don't, they can't feel like oh, I can't say something because I obviously don't know anything like these guys do. It's like, no, if, you, if it's part of something that you know about or it's part of your culture, say something because I want to learn from them as much as they want to learn from me. Absolutely. I think to your point too, that's a huge component of moving cultures from historical to modern, um, especially when we're talking about like indigenous cultures, you know, where... <laughs> These indigenous cultures are alive and well today, right? They are part of everyday society, but the way that they can often get looked at or viewed through an exhibition, unfortunately, can be very colonial, can be very in the past um, because we have to kind of reckon with the fact that museums are inherently colonial, inherently racist institutions. They uphold colonial legacies because that is just the nature of how they came to be. So how do we move forward in still preserving artifacts and objects and art while also recognizing that these coexist with culture today, these coexist with people that are living today. Um, there are ancestral links to, to people all the time. So it's, it's a really delicate balance of 
doing your job and kind of maintaining the care of a collection, but also realizing that someone somewhere knows how to take care of that piece better than you because it is part of them, right? Like it's part of their culture. So I think that's a positive trend that museums, and most of museums recently are kind of moving towards is reckoning with that colonial legacy and trying to do better with how they present their collection and then how they manage the collection as well and the museum as a whole, not just the collection. Yeah, it's important because I know some people are like, well, what's the point of museums now if it's all colonial? Like, am I really getting the real history? Am I getting accurate history? And it's good to see that museums are addressing that and they're not shying away from it and being like, no, like we get our foundations are built in colonialism, but there are ways to build better for the future by engaging with the, the populations that are involved with our collections and with our community. And I, yeah, it's one of those things. Yeah, there's like no right answer again on how to approach that, but it's like that effort you want to see uh, put in that really counts. Yeah. Yeah, how I would you say community involvement, you know, with yeah. whatever community you're working with or whatever the collection is, you know, pieces, community involvement has become really important. How does uh, your museum kind of approach that? Has it had to have any difficult conversations around anything? Oh, absolutely. I think every museum, if they're not, should be having difficult conversations around what pieces they have. Um, sometimes it's a matter of, should we even have this? Um, you know, you start talking about repatriation, um, which repatriation can also be a tricky thing as well, because just because you realize that your museum has something that it maybe shouldn't have, it doesn't mean that you can just automatically give it back, <laughs> because the the person or the people that you would give it back to have to want it. And it's kind of, it's this really um, interesting dance of doing the, the work and then um, working together with the consultant from, you know, wherever, whoever you're talking to um, on the best way to kind of go about that. Sometimes museums, a community may say that the museum is the best place because they are, they have the ability to steward that piece the best. Uh, it just really depends. But yes, those conversations are constantly being had. And I think it's always a matter of having representation from the culture that the object or the artifact belongs to. So working with consultants, working with um, elders, working with community members, um, and not being not hiding it, not sweeping things under the rug, always recognizing that the pieces, you know, there are questionable, you know, um, problematic objects and how do we move past that? That's one component of things that you may currently have. And then it's like, well, what do we do to do better going forward? And that's have being really strict in what you take in, um, which it's, you know, I don't approve of the things that come in. That is not my, that is a higher level position, <laughs> but but that is part of it. So, you know, you may have new donations or new offers for acquisitions. And so what do you do at that point? You know, I think having good provenance research is really important. Knowing exactly where an object came from is incredibly important. Um, how many times it changed hands. Do we know the initial artist, the initial maker? Do we know for sure that it wasn't looted, right? Like, cause this kind of perpetuation of illicit trafficking is, a really important issue <laughs> that kind of revolve around collections, private collectors, museums, public institutions. So yes, those conversations are being had and they should constantly be had. They're tricky. Yeah, very well said. It's not an easy topic, but as long as that conversation continues and it never stops and we acknowledge that we will always be having those conversations and we should always be having those conversations, right. then I think the institution benefits and obviously the public benefits from that as well. Um, my last question, I guess, is basically for someone who's interested in going into the field that you're in or learning more about their local museum, what type of resources would you recommend to somebody? So if you have like a specific museum that you're interested in, reach out to their team. Um, they may be busy, but I'm sure they will get back to you. So that is one piece, like if you're interested in a very specific museum. 
But if you're interested in kind of collections work as a whole, there are a couple of groups. Um, I'm part of the collection stewardship of AAM, which stands for the American Alliance of Museums. So you can look them up, um, collection stewardship. They, it's a great resource and it's a great way to network um, and learn a little bit more. There's also an emerging museum professionals group um, that I'm co-chair of, but that is part of collection stewardship. So there we try to do, you know, webinars and we have a Facebook group. We try to like have a way to ease people that are kind of interested and they want to come up into museums, learn a little bit more. Because it wasn't until I was working in a museum as an art handler doing exhibitions that I even realized I didn't know what a registrar was. I didn't know what my job title was until I was already working in a museum. So it can be, there's a learning curve, but yes, collection stewardship of AAM is great. So is ARCS, which stands for Association of um, Collections, Registrars and Collection Specialists. Same sort of thing, a fantastic group of people that are very, <laughs> very into registration and collections. So I would look into them as well. Um, let's see, I think that is all I have for kind of getting in. Also just looking for volunteer opportunities. Like I said, it's unfortunate, but it is just part of it. And if it's something you're interested in, it will be fun. I think every volunteer opportunity that I've taken, regardless of whether it was museum position or you know, more archeological, I had so much fun. <laughs> so it wasn't time wasted. That's great. Yeah, I think that it's helpful for people, obviously, to to meet somebody like you virtually and hear how they got to where they are, but also to know that there are resources there that are accessible and it, it will take you in multiple directions. You don't need to know exactly where you want to go. You just need to know the direction that you want to kind of travel in. And that's yeah. great. I think that's so helpful. So thank you so much for sharing that. Sure. I have a game for you called Museum Quest, so Thanks. don't worry, no, no, no worries, we'll all learn it together about the okay. museums. <laughs> Welcome back. We are going to play a game now called Museum Quest. Yes, Museum Quest with Safe Cultural Heritage Group, featuring you. Congratulations, you're on a, on a presentation. I did it. I it. <laughs> you did a thing. Um, so this game, the way that we're going to do Museum Quest is basically I will show you a first slide and there's going to be a hint in it it's going to be a continent so that will be first hint first clue and then there will be three written clues and then you'll have to guess either the general location of the museum or if you really know you can go for exactly where it is and its name but no pressure okay, okay. okay. so this is the first one then let's go so museum one location and name so north america was established in 1978, founded by, by Martha Longenecker, and you started working there in April of 2021. Um, that is Minge International Museum. There you go, and you were worried about this game. I was. So please do tell us more about this museum. I know you were talking about it, obviously, in the Q&A, but now that we have a name to the museum, do uh, tell us more. Yeah, so Minge is a folk art museum. Minge means art of the people, um, as it was a movement in Japan. So our museum holds a collection of objects where form follows function. So function is of importance, right? So we're looking at pieces that were crafted to be used, but are beautiful. Um, so we have a collection of like, you know, um, teapots, tea whisks, um, outfits, adornment, things that people wore, but were, were used. So Love great it. place. There it's you in go. Balboa Park. Visit if you can. Let me know if you do. <laughs> yeah, if you do visit, like comment down below and then also tell us if you found our, our guest, because that would be even more funny just to hear all the yeah. comments about people trying to find you. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be right. like, I know her. <laughs> All right. Well, see, that was the easy one. Now, now we're going to go into stuff that's a little more difficult, I suppose. So museum number two is in South America. This museum is built within the covent of Santo Domingo. The covent sits upon the foundations of the Inti Sun Temple. And the name of the emperor in the emperor's new groove is a reference to where the city uh, is, or this museum is located. 
So at least it's let's Cusco. see where. But yeah, it's Cusco. <laughs> uh, it's Cotacancha Museum. That's so I, I'll, it's gorgeous, isn't it? So I'll tell you more about it, unless you know anything about it. I don't know. I don't. Okay, so this. Um, Obviously, like we said, it's inside a coven of Santo Domingo and the sun temple that it's built on is it was built about 1200 BCE and it's an Inca sun temple. So the foundations are basically what's left and then uh, what's on top of it is obviously the uh, conquistadors doing. So congratulations. Um, but it's really cool. Again. <laughs> exactly. Uh, chronological evolution and civilization in Cusco is on display here and it does everything from Inca up to modern day, which is really interesting. Um, but it does revolve a lot around the Curacancha excavation sites. Uh, so obviously you're going to get ceramics, lithic pieces, pre-Inca, Inca and post-Inca. And obviously you can see it's historic. So there's about five rooms inside of this that you can actually go and tour, which is really cool. Wow. Yeah. Anyone who goes to see that one, definitely tell us. Okay. Museum three. This one is Australia. Can't, can't really not tell you it's Australia because <laughs> continent. <laughs> um, but it took over 10 years to build. It's the fifth oldest natural history museum in the entire world, and it's the oldest museum in Australia. So you can at least figure out a city. Yeah, well, um, I'm trying to think of other ones, I'm like Brisbane, Queensland. I'm like, huh. It's actually Sydney. pretty Sydney pretty. Natural History Museum. <laughs> Pretty much. It's the Australian Museum in Sydney. Okay. Yep. There we go. I was like, yeah, that's that's pretty straightforward, honestly. Um, this vision statement says to be a leading voice to the richness of life, the earth and culture in Australia and the Pacific. We commit to transform the conversations around climate change, the environment and wildlife conservation. And they also want to be a strong advocate for First Nations culture and continue to develop world leading science collections, exhibits and education programs. Well, that's always good to hear. Absolutely. Another uh, have place you been, to visit. Yeah, I think that's on the bucket list, isn't it? Yeah. Excellent. See, you're doing fine. We'll, we'll, we'll get <laughs> you done with this game before film. your son wakes up. We got Very this. Good. OK, Museum Four. So this is in Africa. It was first scheduled to open in 2015, but it will now open in November of 2022. It's set to be the largest archaeological museum complex in the world, and it is home to King Tut's wow. entire treasure collection. Well, I'm going to go with Egypt as the location, yep. but I don't know the name, but that sounds fascinating. Yeah, it's the new museum that's coming out, the Grand Egyptian Museum. I see. They've been yeah. doing a lot of the a lot of press, right, with like um, parades and things like that. So many, and it's interesting to see the design. Apparently, in like the Grand Gallery, you'll be able to actually see the Great Pyramids. So I'm like, that wow. would be really cool to see. Yeah, um, they say that their ultimate goal is to become a global center of advanced conservation and research in the field of Egyptology and archaeology, according to international standards. And then they also say that they want to play an important role in the conservation restoration of other artifacts around Egypt and in Africa and just around the world in general in the future. And then one of the things was that they are developing the capacities of the conservators from all around Egypt and in the future the Middle East, North Africa. So basically they have so many different professionals in the field that have just been yeah, going to this museum and getting ready to open it up hopefully by the end of this year and getting everything ready. That's awesome. Man, what would Khufu think, right? <laughs> could you imagine? <laughs> He'd be like, wait, my pyramid could have lit up. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for waiting so yeah. long. <laughs> oh, thanks. I always knew I'd be in the spotlight one day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Museum five. Okay, we're going to Europe now. So this museum's collection has about 800,000 items. It was established in 1966 as a unified complex comprising five museums, which was the geological, the paleontological, the zoological, and the botanical. And it's actually one of the biggest scientific research museums in the world. And I'll give you a bonus hint uh, for the location. They're currently in the middle of a war right now. 
Oh, um, okay. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, like it brings me down to two <laughs> guesses, yeah. right? Um, I guess I will say Russia. Very but close. That's <laughs> South Ukraine. Oh, man. Yeah. The National, National Museum. Museum of History. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize that they were one of the largest scientific museums in the entire world. I was like, good for them. Um, they have been talking a lot recently in this unfortunate war about just how they're hoping for the best and conserving everything in there and protecting it. Mm -hmm. But of course, it can be targeted at any moment. But on the, the good side of things, we're trying to highlight this museum and they, they talk about how they have a world famous archaeological uh, collection. They have a, obviously a bunch of different things in there, such as weapons, ethnographic material. Um, I mean, I could go on and on. It's all down here. But they also have what I thought was interesting was an anti-corruption activities thing on their website. And it basically helps to report any anti-corruption that you either notice in the museum or outside the museum wow. to the museum uh and you can be anonymous like it helps protect whistleblowers and I thought that was very interesting for a museum to do it is interesting I've seen um just for anybody that's interested in like protecting cultural heritage like there has been so much circulating on how the you know museum employees or just cultural citizens of Ukraine are going around doing their best to protect everything from their institutions to even statues outside. Um, and I think too, the US has enacted the Monuments Men, which hasn't happened since World War II, um, comprising now of a bunch of civilians here in the States as well to go over and, and help protect and preserve. So it's yeah. really unfortunate, but hopefully, you know, I guess we can always hope for the best. Yeah, and all we can do, obviously, in our positions is just bring awareness to it. So it's great Absolutely. that, like, you obviously know the resources, you've, you've seen them, and we'll talk about it here on the show. So hopefully anyone that does see this gets to kind of be inspired to look into it for themselves. Yeah, I'd love to look and see if they have an online collection to peruse through. Yeah, doing that after the show, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, well, then Museum 6, this is in Asia. It's a UNESCO World, World Heritage Site. It was formerly the residence of Amala Kings, and the museum's mission is the interpretation of sacred art, culture, and iconography of Hinduism and Buddhism through preservation and exhibition. So, I mean, it's a, it's a bit broad. I think a lot of places are like that, but. Yeah, I don't know Amala Kings, but I'm gonna guess India for the location. Kind of close. Know. Okay. It's in Nepal. Nepal, it's called the Patan Museum. It's really pretty. Um, I had a hard time accessing their website though. They don't have too much up yet. It's not very user-friendly, but okay. their mission statement apparently is, like I said, the interpretation of sacred arts, culture, and iconography. But they also said that they're the first economically self-sustaining museum in the entire country, which is fascinating. It is fascinating. Yeah. But um, I guess this whole thing has a courtyard as well. So the courtyard, I think in 2015, was damaged by an earthquake. But the museum somehow managed to survive the entire thing. Mm. So they have like the courtyard is preserved now. You can obviously go in and see that. You can see the temple complex and the castle of it. And then, yeah, the museum is just everything's preserved inside of it as it kind of would have been back in the day. How interesting. Yeah, yeah. sustainability is another huge kind of a trend that museums are really trying to reach towards. So I'd love to know more about that. Yeah, me too. I really tried hard and I was like, oh, no, gosh, sure. okay. <laughs> I know it's one of those things where sometimes, as you know, museums haven't updated their websites either recently or very well. So eventually I have high hopes we can go online one day and read more about it. Yeah, me too. But okay. Time, yeah. I know. Cool. This, yeah, this last one surprised me. So yes, there is a museum here. <laughs> um, there is a museum in Antarctica, apparently. It's the least visited museum in the world. Who would have thought? It actually cost 28,000 US dollars to get there. <laughs> it sits next to an active volcano and it was first used to house British Naval Officer Robert Falcon Scott's expedition to the South Pole. Even though he never made it there first, he ended up getting beat, I think a couple of weeks beforehand. So poor guy. So my first question is, 
how how do they expect cultural heritage workers on our salaries to get there number one I, <laughs> that's the real yeah. question <laughs> you just never leave you're just stuck living there forever yeah. and we'll bring you what you need <laughs> um i have no idea what this is so this is scott's hut. hut museum yes it's in ross island antarctica i i was as shocked as anyone probably watching this is it was erected in 1911 to again house house the british naval officers expedition uh, he had, let's see, this is 50 by 25 foot hut, very tiny. It was abandoned in 1917 by the British polar explorer, Ernest Shackleton. And today, the original enamel mugs still hang from the shelves and boxes of provisions and some personal effects are actually left behind. And because wow. the climate is so cold, nothing has deteriorated yet. Okay. And it actually sits, yeah, and it sits next to an active volcano uh, Mount Erebus, which I think that's really scary. And it's the second highest volcano in Antarctica. So that's always fun if you want to spend 28,000 to see this <laughs> hut and then be next to an active volcano, do it. <laughs> right. Well, I guess in terms of like archaeological preservation between the, the ice and the volcano, hopefully, hopefully that'll stick around for a while. Ernest yeah, Shackleton's it, been a lot in the news a lot recently yeah for the endurance so there we go that's interesting do, uh, i'm so surprised i know me too and so i'm like i do recommend obviously you and people at home like you guys have to go give it a google because scott's hut is really <laughs> cool inside and i wish i could have like showed more about it but oh yeah really worth the, the nice little google great scott's hut easy to remember yeah, if you forget it, you could just Google Antarctic Museum. There's only one. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and you did it. That was it. There's all the answers. But I told you, it was it wasn't going to be terrible. <laughs> no, that was fun. That was fun. <laughs> was there? Would you find a favorite museum that you want to visit now? Well, I mean, I'm going to be a sucker for the Grand Egyptian Museum. Yeah, you know? me too. Absolutely, it's going to be great. But all of them seem great. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for participating in our game and letting me ask you 50 million questions about everything. But it's great it. to have you on the show. Uh, last thing is, is to roll out the red carpet for you then. Tell us where we can find you, if there's anything you want to shout out, projects, museums, the floor is yours. All right. Well, um, you can find me in San Diego. <laughs> um, my Instagram is Nicole E. Bagley. It's just a personal Instagram. I do sometimes share things, um, but I'm kind of particular about who's accepted because my small baby's face is all over my page. Um, let's see. Currently, I don't have a ton of projects, individual projects, aside from just our museum work. Um, but I do have, I think, some projects that I think people would be interested in. I didn't get to talk too much about like antiquities, trafficking, you know, provenance research a bit more, but I think it's fascinating and I think there's always room for more people to learn about it. So if that's something that you're interested in, um, there are a few places to look that in or look into that. So ARCA, which is the Association for Research into Art Crimes, is very interesting. There's, I feel like art crimes or antiquities trafficking feels like a thing of the past. It is not. It is very much happening today. Looting is still, you know, very pervasive. Um, so in California, we have what is called the California Archaeological Site Stewardship Program, CASIP, because it's a mouthful. Your wherever you're living may have something similar. So if you're interested in doing archaeology and also interested in kind of, you know, preservation of cultural heritage, I would see if you have some sort of site stewardship program. So you can volunteer with an archeologist for us. It's like working with the Bureau of Land Management and they are so stretched thin that volunteers will go out and kind of survey and monitor different archeological sites to ensure that no one is damaging them. Um, and it's a great way to get out if you're interested. Sometimes you can hike, sometimes it's overnight camping. So it's great um, and it's a fun kind of volunteer project. Uh, Donna Yates is also a really great person to look into if you're interested in antiquities, trafficking, and art crime. She hosted a course through Future Learn through the University of Glasgow. Um, she has her own website as well. I think it's called the Anonymous Swiss Collector. 
but a lot of fascinating information on there as well as chasing Aphrodite. So if you're interested in learning more about kind of, you know, illegal trafficking of objects, <laughs> those are great resources. I'm trying to think of anybody else. Um, I'm stuck. I think that's a lot. <laughs> That's that what I read. Obviously, yeah, I like it. We can link all that stuff hopefully yeah. down in the description box below. And if you think of any more before we put this video out, then those will also be in the description box down below. Just let us know. Got it. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. It has been honestly a pleasure getting to talk with you today. And I think everyone has had a great time. But more importantly, did you have fun here? I did. I had fun. I was nervous, but it's been fun. <laughs> Yeah, don't worry. I'm always nervous. That's why I caffeinate. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I know. I, I can't tell if it helps or hurts being caffeinated, but for no, me I personally. Do. I can't tell you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on the show. Of course, for those of you who are watching, if you liked this episode, please hit the like button down below. If you're interested in more episodes like this, we post twice a month. And like we said, we have fun here. So do subscribe if you want to be updated when we post next. Other than that, we will see you on the next episode. Thanks, everybody. Bye.